Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Uh, today I'm going to continue reading from the book Psych K, The Missing Piece in Your Life by um, Robert M. Williams. So I'm just going to jump in today. There was a, the first part of this was in yesterday's video, so feel free to check that out on my channel as well. The rest I'm just going to jump in here. I'm also simultaneously uh, streaming on Bego Live, so um, I'll, I'll do that a couple times a week if you want to see me live. Just follow me on there. Uh, okay, so I'm going to jump in here. As you can see from this example, Psyche was created more out of inspiration than perspiration. It wasn't a laborious intellectual process of discovery, but instead arrived in a series of intuitive flashes of insight. In reality, years of experiences, personal research, and hundreds of books had prepared me for those intuitive flashes. Over those several months, the belief change components that make up the total Psyche K process came to me in separate packages of insights. I was, skeptical, I was skeptical at first. After all, this new way of changing broke every rule I had been taught in graduate school about counseling. It violated the assumption of mainstream psychology that had prevailed for more than 50 years. So before using this new approach with my clients, I experimented with these new patterns using willing friends and myself as test sub subjects. The results were often dramatic and life-changing. Eventually, with a proven track record, I began to use the processes with my counseling clients. The successes continued. With Psych K, I was able to facilitate many changes with my clients in just a few sessions. Changes that took months or even years to achieve with traditional methods were happening in just three to six sessions with Psych K. Eventually, skepticism yielded to evidence and experience. It was working. It wasn't long before I had arranged the information into a workshop format and was teaching it to others. It was gratifying to see how easily people of all ages and walks of life were learning and using this new approach to personal change. What's more, it seemed so effortless. Vishal says, um, do log in. Many renounced, renounced speakers will be live. Uh, Vishal says, catch you around, Kelly. Oh, thanks, Vishal. Vishal is talking about, he, he's on Vigo Live. He's talking about um, uh, the certain, like, uh, like conference that they're having at 1.30 Pacific time today um, with a lot of spiritual um, like teachers coming together for like the day of prayer and fasting. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, today is April 10th, 2020, so day of prayer, you know? Uh, okay, so chapter two. When getting there isn't half the fun. No pain, no gain. Myth of Western civilization. Letting go of the struggle. Let's face it, most people live in a try harder world. It has been the prevailing paradigm of Western civilization for the past millennium. True, it is possible to experience tremendous satisfaction in overcoming obstacles and challenges with sheer willpower and effort. And that's the kind of satisfaction athletes get by becoming the best in their field through extreme physical training. It's the rush of the mountain climber when he or she reaches the peak of a difficult climb. It's the feeling of accomplishment when a performer enjoys a standing ovation after years of discipline and practice. It's when getting there is half the fun that effort and willpower are desirable agents in achieving our goals. However, when you are faced with the debilitating reality of self-defeating behaviors, habits and thoughts that just won't yield to flapping your wings harder against the window pane of life, then getting there isn't half the fun. Willpower and determination are fine if they can actually move you through an obstacle to the freedom waiting on the other side. Unfortunately, most habitual thoughts and behavior patterns don't change with more effort. Willpower and determination become a misdirected and often painful struggle. They become part of the problem rather than part of the solution. If what you need is a caring, compassionate listener with the ability to help you develop insights into the cause of your problems and create new strategies for improving your life, then a good talk therapist is ideal. He or she can provide a safe haven from an otherwise hostile world or provide understanding and support during difficult times. However, when it comes to helping clients implement strategies and insights, the statistics for talk therapy are less than spectacular. For example, studies to determine the overall effectiveness of such therapies concluded that approximately 30% of patients treated for depression showed lasting improvement using insight-based talk therapy. So only 30%. In my private practice, those percentages held true for other behavioral and emotional problems as well. Other studies show that even giving enough, that given enough time, about 30% of patients overcame their difficulties without any psychotherapy whatsoever. 
Oh, thank you, J.M. Casanova. I found this level of effectiveness or ineffectiveness to be unacceptable. My business sense was demanding a more effective rate of return on my clients' counseling dollars. How many psychotherapists does it take to change a light bulb? This joke emphasizes how important effort and determination are in the standard talk therapy approach to change. Jokes like this one usually contain a kernel of truth. That's what makes them funny. So how many psychotherapists does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, but the light bulb has to really want to change. People seeking psychotherapy usually do so after exhausting their personal efforts to overcome the problems they bring to a therapist. In other words, they have already tried hard to make a change. They are looking for some other tool to achieve their goal, besides the try harder model. The problem is that insight, even combined with action and willpower, is seldom sufficient to make lasting changes. Knowing the cause of a problem seldom changes its effect. Uh, Nate Santos says, hey Kelly, how's the rain treating you? It's relaxing. Yes, it, it is very relaxing, guys, if you, you didn't know. Um, I'm here in San Diego. Um, it's been raining for like the past week. Um, yeah, it's nice. Um, I, I heard that there have been certain studies like, with, about the coronavirus saying how humidity can actually um, decrease the amount of spread of the virus because the humidity um, makes the like basically the ability for like airborne illness to travel is reduced because the humidity will like bring it down to the ground. Um, so that's interesting. We'll see if that's the case. I mean, also if we can get to the, this warm weather, that should help as well, but, but we'll see. But yeah, it is refreshing. It's very nice, very cozy being that we're indoors. <laughs> okay. The limitations of insight. My experience in practicing insight-based talk therapy was fairly typical of other practitioners of the art. After weeks or even months of talking about the problem, gaining new insights into its cause and specifying new behavioral strategies, little change took place. Put another way, after all was said and done, more was usually said than done. The fact is that mainstream psychotherapy has been looking in the wrong place for the answers it needs to solve the problem. Looking for the keys. Oh, thanks, Masood. It's nice to see you, too. Do you know the story about the drunk who had lost his car keys at night and was looking for them under a street lamp? A passerby notices the man crawling around on his hands and knees. He stops and asks the guy, what are you doing? The man replies, I'm looking for my car keys. The passerby asks, where did you lose them? The drunk replies, over there in the alley. Surprised, the passerby asks, why are you looking under the street la lamp if you lost your keys in the alley? The drunk replies, because the light's better over here. The keys to meeting the challenges of the human mind aren't usually found where the light shines the brightest, at the conscious level of insight. Although insight may shed light on the origins of a problem and provide some constructive strategies for redirecting your life, it seldom changes the situation or the dysfunctional behaviors. In the dim alley of the subconscious mind is where the real keys to lasting change can be found. Shedding light on the subconscious mind. Because the subconscious mind has more often been thought of as a frightening rather than helpful place to visit, it is important to rethink the true nature of the subconscious in a more user-friendly fashion. If you think of the subconscious as being more like the hard drive in your personal computer, a place for storing past memories rather than Dante's Inferno filled with evil demons who have unthinkable desires just waiting to destroy your life, you will find it a more inviting place to visit. Some people do seem to have an actual computer hard drive that is like Dante's Inferno. If you suspect your subconscious mind is like Dante's Inferno, keep reading. It's not as bad as you think. Oh, thanks, Rana. Sometimes I am my own worst enemy. Everyone has been his or her worst en enemy at one time or another. You notice it when you set a goal and can't seem to achieve it because you keep sabotaging yourself. It happens when you know you need to get a job done but you continually procrastinate. It happens when you know you should keep your mouth shut, but you can't seem to stop yourself, so you blurt out something you regret later. You become aware of it when you hear yourself saying, I just couldn't help myself, after giving in to a habit you have been trying to quit. These kinds of situations usually result in further feelings of frustration and humiliation. Most people over-identify with their conscious mind. It is the part of you that represents the I in most personal statements. For example, I feel happy, or I want to go to the movies. In fact, the I of the conscious mind provides the source for affirmations, positive thinking, and willpower. 
By understanding some key differences between the conscious and subconscious mind, you'll be able to see why the results you had hoped for by using these and other conscious approaches often fall short of your desires and expectations. Oh, Masood said, sorry, but didn't get what you were reading. Oh, Masood, I'm reading the book Psych K, The Missing Piece in Your Life, and it's by, um, it's by Robert M. Williams. He's a researcher um, and, and psychotherapist. And guys, if you came into the live right now and you missed something and you're interested in going back, I am actually putting these streams now. I'm uploading them to YouTube on my YouTube channel. So um, I started the book yesterday. My first video is up there right now. Um, and this one will be on later today, so. Okay, um, here are some of the key differences. The conscious mind, volitional, sets goals and judges results. Thinks abstractly, likes new creative ideas and activities. Time bound, is past and future focused. It often looks for new ways to do things based on past experiences and future goals. Short-term memory, about 20 seconds in the average human being. Limited processing capacity, processes an average of 40 bits of information per second, and is capable of managing just a few tasks at a time. Come on, water break. Okay, the subconscious mind, habitual, monitors the operation of the body, including motor function, heart rate, respiration, and digestion. Thinks literally, knows the world through the five senses, seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, and smelling. Long-term memory, stores past experiences, attitudes, values, and beliefs. Timeless, focuses in present time only, uses past learning experiences to perform current function such as walking, talking, driving a car, and so on. Expanded processing capacity. Processes an average of 40 million bits of information per second and can handle thousands of tasks simultaneously. As you can see, the two parts of your mind are quite different. Both are necessary for you to be fully functional. However, both are specialized in their capabilities as well as the way in which they process life's experiences. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Okay. As is apparent from its processing capacity alone, the subconscious mind plays an important part in your life and represents a major opportunity for assessing and changing old habits of thinking and behaving. Notice the processing capacities of the conscious mind at 40 bits of information per second and compare it to the 40 million bits per second of the subconscious. If the conscious mind desires a goal the subconscious mind disagrees with, guess which mind usually wins the contest? Imagine you are the fly in our story at the beginning of the book. You, your conscious mind, are flapping your wings against the window pane, your subconscious mind, in order to move in the direction of your goal. You are a 40-bit processor pitted against a 40 million bit processor. The odds are clearly stacked against your conscious mind achieving its goal without the cooperation of the subconscious. And Masood says, is your husband okay? Just thought I should ask with the current situation. Yeah, my husband is good. He's actually uh, in the other room right now working. He still has his job. Um, he works, um, he, he's an office worker um, for a construction company. He does, um, he, he's an engineer for them. Um, so he can still work remotely as of right now. Uh, the work has slowed down a bit. Um, I guess they're expecting like more jobs. But they'll know more like mid month to see if like, they'll have enough to like keep everyone on. I'm not too worried. He's a, in a pretty niche position. So we, we were fortunate in this. In fact, my work has slowed down quite a bit because um, a lot of my work is freelance. Well, all my, all my work is freelance. So about like half of my work has completely stalled. We'll be okay, we'll be okay. Um, but yeah, that is the situation, but th thanks for asking, I appreciate that. Okay, um, because of the extraordinary power of the subconscious, it's easy to think of it as your enemy when it seems to be sabotaging your goals in life. In actuality, it is more like a well-meaning but misguided friend who's just trying to do what he or she thinks is best for you. You know, the kind of friend I mean, the one who tries to play matchmaker for you too soon after the loss of a spouse or romantic love interest, or the aunt who sends you her homemade fruitcake at Christmas because it is her favorite cake and she is just as sure it will be yours too. Another way to think of the subconscious is as a computer hard drive with some outdated programs. It's not that the subconscious is actively trying to keep you from being happy or successful, as an enemy might do. 
Masood, I want to ask too, um, how, how are you doing with everything where you are at? It is simply running old programs that produce that effect. It is doing so out of ignorance rather than spite or revenge. Depending upon how you approach the problem, you can try to make the subconscious conform to your wishes using willpower, treating it as your worst enemy, the fly on the window pane approach, or you can learn to communicate with the subconscious in a user-friendly way it understands, the path of least resistance, and make it your best friend. Turning the window pane of life into a window of opportunity. Sorry guys, that was the dryer. Without effectively communicating with your subconscious mind, you may feel like Sisyphus in the Greek story where he is condemned to pushing a rock uphill and never quite making it to the top, only to have it roll down the hill where he must begin the process all over again. The resulting feeling is one of pointless effort and meaningless labor. Getting up in the morning becomes all about pain, struggle, and disappointment. By making your subconscious your best friend, Instead of your worst enemy, you can make your life feel more like a self-fulfilling prophecy than a day-to-day -day struggle. Masood says, just under lockdown, I guess it will be extended till the 30th of April, then we'll see what happens. Yeah, same here, same here, Masood. I wish you well. <laughs> what a crazy time. All right, I'm gonna jump back in. Making friends with your subconscious mind is a lot like making friends with another person. The more you know about the other person's preferred communication style and personal preferences, the more you can communicate with him or her effectively. If you want to please a new friend, you need to know their likes and dislikes, their strengths and weaknesses. If you learn how to please them, they are more likely to want to please you. If you happen to be developing a friendship with someone who speaks a different language, it is useful and respectful of you to learn at least a few words in his or her language. The same is true of your subconscious. In fact, your subconscious does speak a different language than your conscious mind. The two minds may share a common language such as English, French, or German, but they share that language in a unique way. As was mentioned earlier, the conscious mind thinks abstractly, while the subconscious thinks literally. For example, oh, thanks, Jazad. For example, your conscious mind may have a goal to be happy. Many people hold happiness to be a primary goal in life. However, without further clarification of exactly what happiness means, the subconscious mind is at a loss to assist in accomplishing that goal. It's like planning a vacation with a friend and agreeing that you want to go somewhere that is fun. Your idea of fun may be a warm beach and a picture of margaritas. Your friend may be anticipating the joys of climbing a mountain in Nepal. Without further clarification of the concept of fun, one of you will be in for a major disappointment. An important difference between the two language styles is that the subconscious mind can know things only through the five senses of seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, and smelling. The notion of happiness or fun has little meaning to the subconscious until the idea is translated into what is called sensory-based language. Oh, thanks, Masood. Many people are disappointed when they try to accomplish their goals. They are unaware that the subconscious mind is not at all clear about the specifics of those goals, and consequently, it often seems to sabotage rather than support them. Remember, by definition, the perceptions of the subconscious mind are below the level of conscious awareness. So what does it take to effectively communicate with the subconscious mind? Okay, chapter three, the mind slash body connection. We have a quote from Joseph Murray, PhD. He says, every thought is a cause and every condition is an effect. The power of your subconscious mind, 2000. Oh, thank you, Johnny. Communicating with, the, communicating with the subconscious mind. The subconscious directs motor functions in the body. That is, controls muscle movements. It provides a built-in communication link, commonly known as muscle testing. What is muscle testing and how does it work? More than 30 years ago, George Goodhart DC, the founder of Applied Kinesiology, introduced muscle testing in the United States. Applied kinesiology has been used primarily by chiropractors to discover physical imbalances in the human energy system. However, muscle testing is also an easy and effective way to communicate directly with the subconscious mind for purposes of discovering self-sabotaging beliefs. The subconscious mind controls the autonomic nervous system and is responsible for automatic physical and neurological functions. For example, our bodies move because the subconscious mind directs a complex set of electrical signals 
to just the right muscles at just the right time to perform a task, such as reaching for an object. The strength of the electrical signal from the brain determines the strength of the response in the muscles of the body. One theory about how muscle testing works is that the electrical signal is dramatically affected by the thoughts being contemplated in the mind. When the mind is holding a stressful thought, an electrical conflict is created in the brain and the signal strength of the body is reduced, resulting in a weakened muscle response. The same thing happens when a person makes a statement with which the subconscious mind disagrees. The conflict between the conscious and subconscious mind results in a weakened response in the muscles of the body. This principle is similar to the way a polygraph, i.e. lie detector, machine works by detecting physical changes resulting from mental processes. Consequently, muscle testing can be used to determine what thoughts are stressful to the body, as well as what ideas or beliefs are supported or not supported at a subconscious level. In 1999, a study was published in a scientific journal called Perceptual and Motor Skills. The study was entitled Muscle Test Comparisons of Congruent and Incongruent Self-Referential Statements. The study concluded, I'm sorry, so this, the study conducted with 89 college students concluded that overall significant differences were found in muscle test responses between congruent and incongruent semantic stimuli. The results of the present study suggest that the muscle test responds to the congruency of self-referential statements. Simply put, a significant difference between the muscle responses of these individuals when they were making a true statement versus making a false statement was noted. For example, the study used two sets of statements. The first set involved the person's name. The subject was instructed to say, my name is, subject's real or preferred nickname. The second statement was, my name is Alice or Ralph. If subject was a male, Alex was used. If female, Ralph was used. The muscle test was performed immediately after vocalizing each statement. The second set of statements had to do with citizenship. The muscle response itself was measured by a computerized um, dyna dyna dynamometer to assure accuracy. A dynamometer is a device used to measure the resistance and force applied to the subject's arm while being muscle tested. Masood says, in case of reflex action, do the message come from the brain or is it just from our impulse? Well, basically what the book is saying is that we have a conscious mind and a subconscious mind. And so it's this, this muscle reaction is coming from our subconscious mind and our belief system. So it's kind of both. I mean, if, if I'm under, understanding your question correctly, you're saying, is it a reflex? It is kind of a reflex. Um, but it's being told to react in a certain way from your subconscious mind. Now, I'll give you an example. So basically how it works is you will establish um, basically like where you, like what your truth pressure is. So you'll put out your arm and you'll be doing this with a partner and the partner will say, um, your name is Kelly. I say, my name is Kelly and they'll push down on my arm. And it should be pretty strong because my name is Kelly. But if we did the same thing and like here, it said, okay, your name is Ralph. I would say my name is Ralph. And I guarantee you, like try it with another person. Um, your arm will give out a bit, a bit. It will physically feel different than, than where it is. And I, I recommend doing like three different, like very obvious questions. Like, oh, I have brown eyes versus I have green eyes or something like that. Something very obvious um, just to feel it. And it, what's so like interesting is like, I'm a big believer of this because I've been going to a chiropractor basically my entire life and she does this. So I, I, I understand like, like the basis for believing this. My husband, he, he thinks it's kind of, or he thought it was kind of like a weird thing. So he really wasn't like believing it too much, but we did this again. We did this a couple of weeks ago just to test out the theory and it worked even for him. So it's kind of an interesting thing, but you know, chiropractors I know do use it a lot. Okay guys, um, jumping back in. As you can imagine, muscle testing can be used to detect agreement or disagreement with much more interesting self-referential statements than your name and country of origin, such as, I respect myself, I am a loving and worthwhile person, or I do my best and my best is good enough. We will use some of these statements in a later chapter. To experience muscle testing, you will need a partner. Follow these instructions. Note these instructions are a guideline only. Your results may vary. 
Muscle testing is best taught in person. Personalized instruction is provided by certified Psych K instructors in experimental workshop. I also recommend guys, if you're interested in learning how to do this, um, look up Psych K on YouTube and there is like an hour long like instructional video that um, Robert M. Williams gave at a conference a few years back. And he actually takes someone up from the audience and, and does this method with her. So if you are more of a visual person, I recommend that uh, YouTube video to kind of get like an understanding of it. Okay. Um, determine which arm to use for the testing. Otherwise, either arm can be used successfully. The primary muscle being tested in this case is the deltoid, the same muscle used in the muscle testing study referred to earlier. Number one, stand to the side of your partner facing each other so that you are looking over your partner's shoulder of the arm to be tested. Um, see falling photo. You have basically a guy facing this way, his partner is facing this way. And she's holding his arm right here. Okay. The person being tested ex extends one arm out to the side, parallel to the floor. The tester keeps one hand resting lightly on the extended arm between the wrist and elbow. So right here. Uh, where most people wear a watch or bracelet, place the other hand on the shoulder for stability. If one arm gets tired during the testing process, simply switch arms. Number three, the person being tested keeps his or her body relaxed, head facing forward, eyes open and focused down. So your head would be level, but your eyes would be looking down. Um, be sure to keep the chin parallel to the floor while focusing the eyes in a downward direction. Number four, with the arm extended from the side, have the person being tested think of something enjoyable. It can be a person, place, or activity. When your partner is experiencing the good feeling, say, be strong, just before applying a gentle, steady pressure in a downward direction for about two seconds, or until you feel the muscle either let go or lock in place. Avoid bouncing the arm. The person being tested is to resist the pressure of the downward movement while concentrating on the enjoyable feeling. Note the response, either strong or weak. Muscle test your partner and then switch places and have your pop partner test you. Each person tests a little differently, so remember to adjust your pressure to suit the person being tested. Press only as hard as necessary in order to tell whether the test is strong or weak. It is more important that the person being tested can tell the difference being a between a strong or weak response than the person doing the testing. Number five, have the person being tested, your partner, imagine something unpleasant and repeat the preceding muscle testing procedure. Be sure to give your partner enough time to assess the unpleasant feeling before you muscle test the response. Know any difference between the first test and the second. Most people will test strong to the thought of something they like and weak to something they don't like. That is, the arm will stay in place parallel to the floor when the thought is pleasing and it will move down toward the floor when the thought is stressful. The downward movement occurs even as the person being tested tries to keep his or her arm in the parallel position. The downward movement may be subtle or obvious. As long as the person being tested can tell the difference between a strong and weak response, the test is successful. It is the reduction in the electrical signal strength from the muscles of the arm during the stressful thought process that reduces the strength of muscles in the arm. Number six. You can repeat the test using a statement rather than a thought or feeling. To do so, have the partner being tested say something out loud that is true about them, such as my name is, insert actual name. Muscle test the response just after the statement is made. Remember to say, be strong just before pressing on the wrist. Then have your partner say something that is not true about them, such as my name is, insert fictitious name, and muscle test the response. For best results, use name, age, gender, or occupation with test subjects. Most people will test strong to these things that are true about them and weak to things that are not true. Test results will be clearer if the statements are made with emotion. In other words, say the statements like you really mean them and stay focused on the statement while being muscle tested. Important reminder, for successful results, it is necessary for the person being tested to be experiencing the feeling of the thought or statement being tested. By keeping their chin parallel to the floor and their eyes focused in a downward direction, it will be easier to assess the necessary feeling state to ensure accuracy of the muscle test. Except in unusual cases, 
such as paralysis or other neurological disorders. Muscle testing can be an accurate and effective way to communicate directly with the subconscious mind. Like most skills, muscle testing gets easier with proper instruction, practice, and experience. In the next chapter, we will explore another important psychophysiological factor in changing unwanted beliefs, the effects of left brain, right brain, and whole brain thinking. Okay, guys, I'm going to stop there. Um, that was the end of chapter three. And I am going to pick this up next week. And again, if you came in halfway through the live and want to go back and see what I read before, I am going to be posting this video um, up on YouTube in a few minutes. And uh, yesterday's reading, oh, thank you, Unforgivable, um, was posted there as well. And um, my channel name can be found on my profile. It is Kumquat Space Kelly, like the fruit. So um, feel free to check that out. I appreciate that. Thanks for being here. And I will see you next week.